Hey everyone, Pratik here. I want to show you something that I've been meaning to do for a while, and that is review the retouching toolkit panel. I've had it for a couple of years already, so it's kind of long overdue, um, but this is made by my friend Connie Wallstrom. First and foremost, it's found on retouchingtools.com, and it's basically an extension panel for Photoshop that has a few different tools that make retouching a little bit easier. And I always like to talk about things that make things easier because I'm all about efficiency. Okay, great. So this is not a full overview of every single little tool here, but it is a look into some of my favorite features that I haven't seen anywhere else. At least it's because it's compact and I like the way it's organized. Well, first this image here shot by Bella Kotak, and this was for a pro photo campaign that we did for the A1. And I thought this was a great image to use an example. Um, this is already retouched, so we're not going to go retouch this image, but I am going to be using it to show you a few things that it does and what I like about it. So first and foremost is when you actually download the toolkit and load it into Photoshop, it will be found under Window, Extensions, and Retouching Toolkit. And clearly I also have some other ones like, you know, Lumenzia and uh, Nino Batista's Frequency Control Panel. I don't use them all the time, like I mentioned, and if you've seen my workflow, it's all pretty much action-based. But um, there are a couple of things here that I think are really useful. Number one, I'm gonna jump into it, is the Gradient Map Maker. Now, for those of you who are already familiar with Gradient Maps, they are used for color toning or color correcting. So let's say that across the face, there are certain color issues, like maybe the hand over here has a little bit of a red cast that I should have fixed or maybe the shadow is a little bit too desaturated that I want to add a little bit more of the neutral color tones into. Well, normally the gradient map itself is manually placed under the um, adjustment panel, adjustment layer panel. And what happens is you have to manually set the colors you want in your shadows, your highlights, and your midtones. And for those of you who do this, you know it takes a while to set it up and execute. So this gradient map maker here is a simple little tool that once you click on it once, it first wants you to select one color for your highlight. So I'll select something like this. Then when I hit OK, it comes up with another option that says select your midtones. And remember, even, to, even though it doesn't say select your midtones, just take my word for it. So it says select my midtones, OK. And finally, select a color that I want to represent my shadow. So maybe something like this. And once that's done and I hit and I hit three options, I'll click on cancel for the next one. And what that does is basically sets up this gradient map uh, adjustment layer. Now, when I click on the gradient map itself, you'll see that it tries to define um, exactly where that shadow color should be placed, where the mid-tone color should be placed, and where the highlight color should be placed. And it's leaving the rest of this blank because I think what's happening is this is the deepest part of the shadows that it doesn't want to interfere since we didn't really select it, as well as you know the brightest part of the highlights. This range over here represents the entire range um, pretty much of the image and anything blank is left as is. So you can see the black parts here, uh, they're not shifting colors so much. In effect, what that does is if I go ahead and set this layer back to normal, you can see that it represents the tonal range perfectly because it's not uh, brightening up the shadows, it's not you know muddying up the highlights, it's keeping a pretty realistic tonal range of what the image is and it's just replacing the color. And the great part is when I change it to the color blend mode, uh, it, you can see it does a good job of, of highlighting what that tonal range is. Now the way to use this is I'll select my mask, I'll hit Command I, and then with a regular brush set to, let's just say, you know, 10%, okay? Um, I would go in and start brushing anywhere that I want to fix. So if I started brushing somewhere like this, you'll notice that it slowly comes in and changes the amount that it fixes that red area. Now. By nature, I always reduce the opacity to say, you know, 35, 45, somewhere around there, because it does a better job of blending in the natural tone with whatever tone I wanna 
want to blend in. Um, the same thing goes for anything else that I want to even out and match to that gradient map. You can also do another gradient map just for the lipstick, or you can continue working here and add the same level as anything else. So this is great, especially if you have a lot of color tonal, color tone differences across the skin. That is really useful. Um, and it stops me from doing the gradient map over and over again manually, which sucks. And this is a good way of letting it automate that process. So plus point number one for the gradient map maker. That is something that is really key for me. Second really cool tool that I've found is a smart liquify function. So for those of you who already liquefy at the end of your retouching process, what you'll notice is that let's say, for example, I set up another, you know, solid layer on top, call this liquefy and I liquefy something. Let's say that I go into liquefy and any day now, let's say that I do something really stupid. Let me turn off my show backdrop so we can see what's happening here. Let's say I liquefy something and I hit OK. What happens is that if I work underneath this liquefy layer, I have to, I have to re-liquefy. So if I come underneath this layer, let's say if I add a blank layer, um, I select the healing brush tool and I turn off my liquefy layer. Let's say I want to remove a couple of these extra bits of grass, right? Or dirt. Um, and I do that. I'm like, hmm, this looks good and I want to apply it to my liquify layer. Well, I can't because the liquify layer has a merge visible stamp from a few steps ago. So I can't take this and put it into this without doing the liquify all, liquify all over again. So what this panel has is a smart liquify. So if I click on smart liquify and start liquefying after that, what happens is magic. So I'll show you in a minute. Um, so it loads up the liquify. And if I do the same thing, obviously you wouldn't want to do this, but this is just for example purposes. And I hit OK. It sets up that smart liquify for me, right? Now, if I go underneath and do that same thing again, where I, you know, I do my healing and I'm like, hold on, I want to make sure that this fits in here. Well, all I need to do is click on Smart Liquify and say Update Smart Object. And so watch what happens. It's going to take the same layer and it's going to update the Liquify so that it fixes. There you go. There you go. So you can see the Smart Liquify itself updated to match what I healed out and then included in there. So that was awesome. And I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So those are my two favorite features. Of course, the other things that I like about this are the fact that it does come with the iHelp folder standard. So if you ever want to see, um, <laughs> if you ever need help, this arm looks really bad. Let's, let's delete that. If you ever want to have help uh, while you're retouching and you want to see if, you know, there's any spots in the background, I use the solar, the solar curve for that. Um, but the, again, these are set up by actions in the back end. So if I go under actions and you see all these actions that Connie Wallstrom has, um, they utilize the actions to make the panel work, if that makes sense. So um, of course you can set this up on your own as well. So these are not a, these are not a huge deal, but it's really convenient. Uh, so these are all the ways that you can look at the image in different views. So the hue, for example, shows the exact, um, I guess you could say the exact hue that the particular area has. For instance, um, if I look at this image here and I want to see if this has more of a pink cast or a more of an orange cast, I'll click on hue and see that this has more of a pink undertone to it because it kind of increased the level of saturation across the image equally. And the reason for that is it gives me an idea of which specific tone that area has. So if I see something that I'm not quite sure 
if it has a more pink cast or a yellow cast, I'll click on this and it gives me a full idea of what it is. So it makes color, color correction a lot easier. And then if I try to combine this with the gradient map, it would make it a lot easier. Secondly, it also has one for seeing the luminosity and color as well, as, as you can see by these two adjustments here. It also has one for you know different levels of saturation. So when I click on this, I can see that based on what is black, sorry, here we go. If it's black, it gives me indication that there's less saturation. If it's in saturation, it gives me indication that there is, you know, more of more saturation happening in that area. I think that's pretty self-explanatory as well. So it gives you different views on what's happening by taking these individual channels in the selective color and putting it down to negative 100 and the whites, the shadows and the blacks, it increases them to plus 100, which creates this effect. And it's pretty handy. Um, and I think this is something that is quite useful for you um, if you're looking to color correct. So that's another thing that's really handy. It obviously has your dodge and burn or dodge or burn. Um, it has a 50% gray layer if you want to dodge and burn through that. Or it has a blank layer set to soft light if you don't want 50% gray in it, which is really handy. It also has other blank layers. So you can see color is set to color. Saturation is set to saturation. And you can even out colors that way. So maybe if you have, you know, an area of saturation that you want to match up and you say, you know what, um, I like the level of saturation that's over here and I want to increase saturation that's here. I'll select it and then start brushing and increase it that way. Obviously you do it a lot less, maybe like a 1% flow and then just start brushing really gently and you can increase the level of saturation from one area to match another. The same thing goes for, you know, the makeup. So if you want the same level of saturation of the face to match the makeup for a matte, you know, kind of like a matte desaturated look, I'll do the same thing. Let's increase our flow. So you can see it, it kept that like plumish reddish color, but it decreased the saturation to match whatever saturation the area is over here. So it's kind of cool. It has a few things there. Um, it also has curves, color balance, etc. So you don't have to click on these or go into window and adjustments. Next, you have a few things like stamp current and below. So it creates a merge visible stamp on top um, for your own other purposes like liquefying or sharpening or whatever it is. And it has your frequency separation as well. The other thing that it has is masking options. Under masking, it also includes luminosity masks. So if you want to create a shadow mask alone, uh, which is found under window and channels, you'll see here, uh, that's not what I wanted. Let's close that uh, window and channels. There we go. So on the right hand or left hand side, you'll see the shadows. The shadow mask itself is located there. And if I want to use that, I'll click on command, click on my shadow mask, and then I could use that in combination with something else like curves and increase my adjustments. Let me go back to my layers, click on this, click on my curves itself. And then when I increase or decrease, I can increase or decrease my shadows. So that's just a quick overview about how luminosity masks work. If you want to clean up your channels, I'll just say remove generated channels and it removes that. Um, another good feature is it has highlights, midtones, and shadows. It also allows you to create a specific zones. So if I hit generate zones, it will create a mask based on the specific zone. So if I want to create a mask for a specific region, like my super highlights, super highlights, or my midtones, or you can see my these are my shadows because they're all white. And as you know, a mask works by having anything selected that's white reveals. So that would be my shadow mask. It sounds cooler than it is shadow mask. And it gets more defined to a deeper shadows, right? Um, so these are my different zones here, which are great. 
and I can create a mask based on that too. I can also create a blend if mode. So if you're not familiar with blend if modes, let me delete this curve here for a moment. Let's say I create a curve. And if I decide to create a curve and I want it only affected in my highlights, I'll click on highlights. And so what it does is this curve won't affect the deepest shadows, it'll only affect the highlights. And you'll know this because under your layers, you'll see these two little boxes here. So when I click on it, I can see that over here, sorry, over here, the underlying layer, it's adjusting this so that it starts tapering away into the shadows, which is really useful because what that's doing for me, I'll show you. So let me bring this little point back up. So it starts like this, and if I hit Option and click, it increases this so that you'll see that the shadow area stays however dark it was, or however it was originally. Whoops, there we go. So I'm gonna bring this back to the right. And if I even increase this further and hit OK, and turn this on and off, you'll notice it. You'll see the deepest shadows stay intact because we've turned off that part of the layer or part of the underlying layer. So it's not affecting any of the deepest shadows. So that's what that means. So if I select um, shadows, what that means now is if I decrease or increase that, it's only affecting the shadow region and keeping everything pretty standard, but it's fading it away so that the transition is nice. If I click on midtones, then it'll only affect most of the midtones, or it tries to. Um, and I can always override that by just going in here and deciding what I want it to do. So if I wanted to affect everything, I can just make sure that these double arrows at the endpoints and play with it that way. So that's what it does. Let me go ahead and delete that curve. Next is you can clear blend if modes um, if you decide you've really screwed up. <laughs> um, they also have this little composite mode here. So in case you want to use the golden circle to see if your your composite your composite 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 <laughs> your composition. Oh my god, your composition's okay. Um, you're able to select these different view modes, which is really handy. And if I want to be super awesome, I'll click on all of them at once. So my composition's super great. <laughs> That's the key to photography right there. Super great composition. Okay, enough joking around. Next, you also have an export tab so you can resize for the web if, uh, and it tells you how long do you want the long edge. So if you're for Facebook or something, you put 2048 and you hit OK. And it makes a copy for you as well. So you don't save on the other one by accident. And this is great. And you can say, let me sharpen that up a little bit and say OK. And then once it does that, I can paint on this mask and sharpen up whatever I want to sharpen up. So there you have it. Um, and as well, there's other things like resize for Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And I think um, that pretty much covers my favorite parts of the retouching toolkit. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to either message me or Connie, but I think messaging Connie would probably be the best bet since he has a full grasp of all these tools. And as likewise, check out the website and check out YouTube for these individual tutorials. I well, hope that was useful and let me know if you decide to grab it. I'm excited to see what you'd create with it.